Hey, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us. We are back with another AIM Live. We have decided we are going to limit the lives that we're doing this year to just the most critical and impactful conversations that are related to the broker community this year. So we are on live number two of 21 for the year. That's where we're maxing things out. And we thought this was a really important topic to include and to make sure everyone has full visibility on what is going on the state of the appraisal industry. There's a lot of questions right now. There's some concerns floating around, um, lots of conversations around the direction the industry is going and its impact on the broker community specifically. So John Tallinger from Class Valuation has graciously joined us for this conversation today. John, thank you so much. We're glad to have you. Katie, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. Appreciate of course. it. Of course. We are going to dive right in so that we can keep this in a short period of time for y'all to get as much information as possible as quickly as we can. So, um, John, can you just give us a little bit of a background on where the concept of AMCs came from? We've got a lot of people that are new to the industry, some that knew pre-AMC world, some that have only ever known a world with AMCs, but can you give us some background on where they originally came from, um, why they were created initially, and sort of where we're at right now with the state of the AMC space? Yep. Great question. Um, so I, I was, uh, I don't know if I want to say fortunate or not, but I was fortunate enough to be uh, part of the industry prior to 2008 and have been part of the industry since then. Um, so 2008 has kind of always stood out as the year where uh, the AMC or the appraisal uh, function in, in the mortgage process changed quite a bit. Um, when we had the kind of market crash and fallout in 2008, um, both sides of, uh, of, of Congress came together uh, and Dodd-Frank bill passed. And uh, all of a sudden, lenders were required to put some safeguards in place in terms of uh, the, the valuation process, in terms of, of ordering appraisals. Um, so lenders uh, still do have the ability to manage the process themselves internally, but there's some there are some some risks to that, um, uh, and if they don't choose that route, their lenders are required to use uh, appraisal management companies. So we're essentially, uh, you know, an independent third party who, uh, you know, it's our job. We take in orders and we source the the best appraiser for each individual job, um, each individual assignment. And and I think that the the general idea behind that was. Uh, prior to 2008, loan officer used to be able to just call the appraiser that he or she wanted to and ask the appraiser to do the assignment. And uh, there was, unfortunately, that, that caused some some problems that caused some some undue influence. Um, the appraiser, the appraisers in, in many instances, you know, were not able to be unbiased because they felt if they didn't, um, you know, appease the the loan officers or the loan originators that they would essentially lose lose business or they would get shut off or turned off. Um, so AMCs, there, there were AMCs prior to, to Dodd-Frank, but they're, they really became prominent because of the requirement to use them afterwards. So that's kind of where where we began. And uh, it's a little tricky because, because, you know, people always feel the grass is greener. And um, I know some people say, well, you know, AMCs, um, some people have issues and problems with AMCs, but we do, we, we do play an important role in the process in making sure that it's an unbiased, you know, uh, opinion to value from a, a licensed professional. Yeah, and I think that's, it's that part, right? It's that critical component of somebody who's unbiased, who is genuinely just trying to do the job that's put in front of them without any sort of internal or external influence on the path forward, right? We talk a lot about how brokers are a better option for consumers because they're putting the consumer first. They're trying to do the job, protecting the customer that they're working with and making sure that they're finding the right partner, the facilitation of the process is successful without any of those internal pressures of working at a retail lender or working at a bank that you have to meet specific quotas or you've got certain margins that are requirements. It gives you more flexibility. You have more options. And that's kind of essentially what AMCs are doing, right? Making sure that appraisals are, or appraisers are facilitating the job that's necessary to help make sure the rest of the process runs smoothly without any influence impacting someone's ability to do that job. Absolutely. Yep. And, and, and at the end of the, the day, you know, our, 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 our end goal is to, you know, uh, is to ensure the lenders and the banks, the, the lender clients that we have, that we are, uh, you know, essentially safeguarding them to make sure that they're getting a fair piece of collateral, uh, you know, that, that's, that's been completely unbiased. 
Yep. So what if, what are some of the biggest challenges that are associated with AMCs right now? We hear a lot. Everybody who's a part of the Brokers Are Better group, there's a lot of conversations going on with AMCs and appraisers and um, a lot of praise, some frustration. There's clearly a lack of um, supply in a very demanding market right now. But what are those challenges that y'all are seeing quite regularly and trying to tackle head on right now? Yeah, so uh, there's been talk for for you know a long time about about uh, the the aging appraiser population. I know many different aspects of the mortgage industry, um, you know, trying to get fresh blood and 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 trying to you know integrate integrate a you know a, a new you know younger workforce has been has been a big topic of discussion. Um, it's just you know when we look at the the, the different uh, pieces of the industry you know real estate agents and and uh, loan originators and and appraisers um, but con- unfortunately or for better or for worse becoming an appraiser it, it's it's there's a, a high threshold that you have to go through to become a licensed or a certified appraiser and it takes time to get there it's generally from start to finish uh, uh, you know, two to two and a half year process. And, and the oh, tricky wow. part, yeah, and the tricky part there is that, um, you know, there's a lot of classroom hours, um, a lot of sort of on the job training. But part of the problem is, is that is that you can't make that much money in that time frame. So that two or two and a half years that it takes you to get up to scale, you know, you're, you're sort of working for for peanuts for the most part. Um, and that's very difficult. If, if, if you're just coming out of college, maybe that's easier to do. But if you're, if, if you, you know, have a career in the insurance industry and you want to become an appraiser, you might have to take a, a pay cut to get there. So it's not as easy, um, you know, for a lender, if you, if, if you, if you grow and, and you need to hire more underwriters, you can train them up and get them up to speed, um, you know, relatively quickly. Loan, yeah. uh, loan originator, real estate agent, you can, you can get licensed and, and, and get to the point where you're making good money pretty quickly, but it's just a much longer process for, for appraiser. So, that's that's an issue. You've got that aging appraiser workforce, and then on top of that, um, there's there's you know been some hesitancy from from appraisers who have been seasoned, who have been at it for years, to to take on apprentices and to and to train younger appraisers. So um, we we've started to see capacity issues. Uh, granted, there there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes, and we're trying to stay involved in, in, in finding ways to to bring fresh blood into the industry. But right now we sort of hit the perfect storm in, uh, you know, mid mid 2020 or maybe at the start of the second quarter of 2020 with when, when interest rates drop, obviously, you know, refinances start falling out of the sky. And when volume rises, um, there's certain areas where you just hit a, a, a capacity issue where there's just not enough appraisers to manage all the all the assignments that are needed. So that's been probably the biggest issue that AMCs have been facing is the capacity issues with appraisers. Well, I think you made a really great point, right? Last year, we saw everyone struggling to handle the volume that was coming. There were capacity issues from every angle, every part of the industry, regardless of channel, regardless of role, um, lenders, brokers, loan originators, appraisal, or AMC companies, appraisers. There, there were issues everywhere. But to your point, staffing up and bringing more appraisers on board takes a lot longer instead of being able to staff underwriters or staff processors or going out and finding LOAs that can help support your current business model. So where other parts of the industry were able to react and plan and adjust in a couple of months, um, in the appraisal space, it takes a couple of years. So there's not really a way to, to see direct change in real time because it does just take so much longer for somebody to become licensed and to be able to take on those types of roles. Absolutely. And, and, and we've started to see, I mean, even uh, in, in 2020, we started to see areas that, that we've never seen certain markets that just, you know, for instance, Northern California, if we said Bay Area, San Francisco or East Bay, um, well populated areas mm-hmm. where generally appraisals would take uh, historically, you know, six business days, seven business days. All of a sudden, those appraisers, we started speaking with those appraisers in those markets and uh, they're getting two to three to four times as many orders as they are used to getting. And, and look, they want the money. They're taking on as many orders as they can, but there's just not enough hours in the day. Um, yeah. and, and so it, it, that's, that's resulted in extended turn times. And, and in some instances, you know, we can offer to pay them more. Um, but believe it or not, in a lot of instances, in certain markets that are really, really, uh, you know, busy right now in, in terms of volume and demand, um, 
money doesn't even help. I mean, we're, we're going to appraisers and we're offering them a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars to get an appraisal turned around quickly. And, and, and they're, they're, they're kindly coming back and saying, look, we want the work, but we, we, we can't slot you in front of these other people. So um, it, it's been it's been challenging, but we're certainly working on ways to try and uh, try and get that back to normal. Yeah. So what are some of those things? What are you all doing to try and support the fact that there are capacity problems? Are you looking at utilizing other roles, developing different services? Like, how do we address this problem? Because clearly the industry can't sustain an a couple more years of waiting for more appraisers to be available or ready. There are problems that we need to try and address right now. So how are you guys doing that and how can the industry help support that need? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, and, and as you know, a lot of this is, is rate dependent. So if the rates, if the rates moved, you know, in, into the, you know, high threes or, or fours, you know, in, in the next, you know, couple months, that would probably sort a couple things out. Not that, that, that not that that's what people are, are looking for, but you know, the refinance demand that was that was because rates being so historically low, that was a, a huge piece of it. Um, so it does seem like rates have, have kind of softened a little bit lately. So so we'll kind of see if that if that has an effect. Um, but yeah, behind the scenes, we've got we've got quite a few things that we're working on. Big picture, long term, we are working on initiatives with trying to work with uh, some, some different organizations to get more appraisers into the industry or get more fresh blood into the industry. Um, and then in terms of technology, I know we'll talk more about this later, but there's some things, bigger picture that we're working on to um, you know, use technology to reduce turn times to sort of work uh, smarter and not necessarily harder. Um, and, then, and then internally right now, I mean, we're, 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 we're fighting, we're competing with other appraisal management companies with banks that have direct appraisal panels. Um, we're, we're competing for those those appraisers. So really, just like we partner, we you know we we have strong partnerships with the broker community. We we work very hard to build strong advocacy and relationships with the appraisal partners, our appraiser partners as well. Um, so you know you you have to treat those appraisers well. You have to pay them well. You have to pay them quickly. Um, you have to offer them support uh, when they need it. Um, another thing that's really important for appraisers is. If, if you can keep them, you know, give them more orders if they perform well and keep them close to home. You know, if they're mm -hmm. only covering one county as opposed to four, um, you know, the time is money there. So just doing some things like that behind the scenes uh, to try to, you know, reduce the, you know, some of the strain that the people that the brokers are feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just the industry in general, right? We're still in a, a having an influx of business and trying to navigate how to tackle that and what to do. And it changes every day. So there's a lot of work that I know you guys have talked about doing that you are doing, trying to also just drive education around opportunities of being an appraiser, right? A lot of what we're trying to do with Ignite and driving education around what opportunities in the mortgage industry look like and the kind of career you can build as an LOA or an LO or a processor and where you can take that career. Um, are you guys doing anything to help drive that understanding or acknowledgement of the fact that there is an industry that you can do really well in that just requires some training up front? Yeah, we are. We are. Um, you know, we, we're not doing quite as much there today as we're as we will be a month or two from now. We're we're in conversations. Uh, we have some initiatives that, that are still kind of in, in the infancy, but um, we are. We're we're definitely trying. Um, we're trying to help source. Uh, you know, training appraisers. We're trying to help get them get them matched up with appraisers that we know in those in those specific markets, so that they can actually get their apprenticeship hours in and get to the point where they're licensed and ready to go and ready to be part of the you know full on workforce. Um, you know, the other you know the the big piece that we're that we're working on is we've really um, you've heard for years. I, it's funny. I just saw an article that rolled through today from Appraisal Buzz about uh, the impending doom of appraisers. Um, and, and, and they kind of jokingly take a jab at, hey, we've been hearing this for 15, 20 years now that, you know, appraisers will be absolute, obsolete soon and they'll be replaced by, you know, Zillow. Um, so we, we don't see that happening anytime soon. We have, um, you know, us and, and other, you know, uh, stakeholders in the industry um, are, are, are spending a lot of our time and, and resources on technology to be able to, mm -hmm hopefully bifurcate the process. Um, there, there's, there's pilots that we're, that we're working on. Um, we're working with lenders. We're working with the GSEs on, on ways to, uh, you know, speed up that timeline. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll start to hear more about some of the 3D scanning apps where um, whether we bifurcate it from 
having having one appraiser go out and actually scan the property and and that's all that appraiser does is they just go scan three four five ten properties a day and that data is that's collected from the very very um, impressive camera or, or, or device delivers all that information back to a different appraiser who just does desktop work and who is cranking out those appraisals and doing the actual analysis. So, um, you know, I think that that's sort of what we're hoping to see in the future. Um, you know, there, there, there is some um, conversation about, you know, possibly non-appraiser workforces that would actually go and scan the property and, and do the actual inspection of the property and really, you know, rely on the appraisers to do the, the you know, the, the analysis work from the desk, uh, you know, that, that we, we think that that could shrink the time, but all those things have to go through beta testing, have to go through pilots. Uh, but but there is that's likely where we're going to see a lot of the future of the industry going, um, trying to utilize you know those pieces of technology. Yeah, it's taking a little bit more of a manufacturing mindset, right? Breaking down the entire process, looking for specific efficiency gains in each individual piece of the puzzle, so that it's not one person that's a dependency for the entire thing, but eight people who all have a specialty or a specific role and they can stay focused on that within that period of time, whether it's a day or a week or a month of doing one type of work to be able to knock out it as many as possible and create as much efficiency as we can. Absolutely. And we think that could also, you know, in a lot of ways could extend, you know, the lifespan of, of, of an appraiser. If I, I think wow. about it, uh, for me, if I was a, an appraiser that was, that was getting older and didn't want to spend my winters in Michigan anymore, um, you know, I could, I could live in Florida, yeah. but I could still do the desktop portion of the appraisals for appraisals in Michigan, where my where my geographic expertise is. Yep. Um, and so I think that there's there's if, if we you know keep getting creative and, and, and keep working together for solutions, we're, we're getting towards some pretty cool things. So yeah, some of the other groups that we've talked about that y'all are doing some work with are these um, appraisal advocacy groups and and organizations that are out there. Um, somewhat similar to what AIM is for the broker community. There are groups and organizations that are trying to look at the appraisal space and the impact it has on the industry. Can you tell us a little bit about where you're involved there? I think you mentioned Scott on your team is on the board, one of these organizations. What are you guys doing on that side? Yeah, yeah, there's some different, there's some different, you know, advocacy boards, there's some different, uh, you know, uh, trade groups out there. Um, you know, the one group that's, that, that's, you know, we've just been, we've been part of for, for years. And, uh, you know, I would say um, definitely there, there, I know there's a ton of you know, large banks involved, um, uh, probably credit agencies and a lot of the, you know, more established appraisal management companies uh, uh, have involvement in uh, the CRN, the Collateral Risk Network. And I'd love to try and see if we can bridge the gap and get and get AIM yeah. um, in, involved there because um, it, it's just a it's a it's a very very good group that um, is really looking out for the future of valuation. Um, Scott Rose, as you mentioned, our chief innovation officer, is one of the uh, is one of the, the seven board members at on the collateral at, at the collateral risk network. Um, but I think I think long term, I mean, what what we're trying to do and what we're trying to get across to the appraiser population is. We're not trying like none of us want to replace appraisers. We want to empower the appraisers. We want to you know put the right tools and resources in the appraisers' hands to make their job easier, so that they can so they don't have to you know do some of the long uh, painstaking tasks that they've they've had to in the past. We want to make their job easier and more efficient. And mm -hmm. on that, because I think we have a couple minutes left, and I want to make sure that we touch on this before we wrap up. What can the broker community do to support that? How do they set expectations appropriately in the midst of kind of a crazy environment where consumers are not just on the refi side, but now starting to compete very aggressively for a limited supply of homes? Um, there's a lot of places where houses are getting bid, you know, 10, 12, 15 times in the first 24 hours. And when you're required to go through the appraisal process, how can we make sure that the broker community is prepared for those conversations with consumers and also ensuring that things move as efficiently as possible once the order hits the AMC? Yeah, so so really good questions. Um, and, and so like one of the things that we, you know, you and I talked off air a little bit about was, um, you know, some of the, the common complaints and some of the common things that we hear about, um, you know, uh, you know, AMC's underpaying appraisers, that sort of thing. Um, you know, first off, 
right now I can tell you we're we're, we're paying appraisers. We I can't speak for other MCs, but we pay the appraisers what their what their posted fee is. Um, uh, and and right now in a lot of markets we're we're having to pay the appraisers more. Um, you know to get the same job done because of the the shortage right now. Um, the 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 bidding process. I know you asked. About. So what's what's causing some of the delays right now is we talked a little bit about you know San Francisco area, the Northern California. Right now, what's happening is is we appraisal management company gets an order in and they go to place it with an appraiser. Um, in the past, historically, a year ago, usually the first appraiser or the second appraiser that you know we would try would accept the assignment. Right now, we're getting the appraisers are so busy. You know, sometimes we're having to go through 15, 20 different appraisers to reach out to that are either some aren't responding, some are responding that, hey, I'm slammed or I'm backed up. So uh, the assigning process right now is, is more difficult. It's taking longer to get appraisers to accept the assignments. So we're we're not we don't just throw a, a bid out there openly and say, hey, the cheapest person gets it. It's in instances like that, especially like in the purchase market, when something is when, when they're time sensitive. We will, you know, in, in, in a lot of these instances, we'll reach out to, you know, a group 10, 15, 20 appraisers in that market and say, hey, look, here's an assignment that we have. We really need it back by this date. What is, is your fee? What date can you, you know, agree to have it back to us by? And, and what would your fee be? So that we don't have to go to one appraiser, wait for four hours to see if they'll accept it, go to the next one, wait for four hours. That, that's what the bidding process is. So it's not a broadcast. It's it's a bidding process for, for them to come back to us with what their fee in turn time would be. And so on the consumer side, what, how do we set expectations? Because it does vary so much by market, right? Exactly what you're saying. There's certain areas that are feeling this impact a lot more than others. So going into purchase season, trying to get ready for a competitive environment, especially in a lot of areas where people don't have to live in the city anymore. They can move a little bit further away. They're not required to be in office as often. We've seen it already start to pick up pretty intensely and i'm sure the summer is just going to magnify that even more um how do we educate consumers on what this process is make sure that they understand what goes into the appraisal um, portion of the whole loan process um and make sure that they're ready for it when the, it is time to have the home or the property appraised right what to expect what happens if it comes in a little too low what do we do? How can brokers really help communicate those things up front so there aren't as many surprises and um, fires, if you will, a little bit later on? Absolutely. So a whole, whole bunch of things to unpack there. Uh, the best, so like you said, uh, the best thing for any of us to do, uh, brokers, MCs, lenders, set, set proper expectations. Um, I, class, I know we, we specifically have, you know, turn time dashboards that we have built. And, and I'm assuming, uh, I'm hoping a lot of other AMCs as well, you know, reach out, you know, speak to the AMCs and find out what expectations should I have? So these are like the five counties that I lend in. I don't really care what the average turn time is in my state. Tell me what's going on in my county. So what's yep. going on in these five counties? What's your average turn time? So what should we expect? So we know what to tell the consumer. Um, uh, and then also, yeah, obviously, you know, educating if it's a, if it's a refinance, you know, making sure that the homeowner knows, hey, look, the appraiser is going to be calling you, schedule the appointment with them, um, make sure there's no, you know, health and safety specific issues. I mean, if you have open light socket with wires hanging down, that might be a problem. Um, that's a separate thing. I'll try to get you guys uh, a list of some yeah. know, list of things to, to that, that, you know, that, that maybe um, you guys can, you know, can share with the borrower to prepare them. Or with the you know the the agent, um, so yeah, I mean, like you said, setting proper expectations, I think, is, is the biggest key, um, and, and especially right now, like I said, knowing your specific market and knowing what the expected term times should be. Awesome. Well, John, it's been great having you. Um, this was very helpful. Um, I'm sure we'll have you back very soon. I know y'all have a ton of really exciting initiatives that are going to be rolling out sooner rather than later. So everyone definitely keep your ears and eyes open for um, a lot of the uh, the fun new things that I know the team over at class is working on. Uh, anything else you want to drop to the broker community before we sign off? Uh, just that I, you know, I love as much as I love talking to you guys on the phone, we miss seeing you in person. So <laughs> we can't wait. I know, um, you know, 
all of us are, are, are itching to get back to, to in-person events. I think that, um, that that communication, that in-person contact feel is, is what really helps to drive a lot of us. Um, Katie, you and the team are doing a great job at AIM. We're, we're very happy to be, you know, we're, we're proud sponsors and, and partners. Um, and, and, and please, you know, the, the biggest thing, um, we want to be there to help. So, so brokers, um, if you're having concerns, you're having issues, um, you know, reach out to AIM, reach out to us, let us know what we can do to help. Uh, but, but thank you so much brokers for, you know, for you know, putting up with the, you know, the, the difficult market that we're in right now. Uh, thank you for being great partners and uh, we're here for you. I can't wait to see you guys all soon. Yes, we will see you at Fuse. We are pumped that planning is going very well. It's going to be a, um, a huge event this year that we're very excited about and very eager to have class back back there with us, joining us in person in Las Vegas. Uh, John touched on it. If there are any issues with uh, with class or with any of our AMC partners, uh, any of our lender partners, really anybody that we partner with, you can always reach out to AIM, let us know. Um, we've got a really easy escalation process. We send the information over literally in real time as soon as it comes through. Class also has a great escalation process internally and a great broker advocacy team that our, our friend Michael Holmes oh, runs. So, yeah. Um, there's lots of options. Please do not let something sit. If something's going off the rails, if something isn't working out the way that you need it to, or that you expected it to reach out to us, both class and aim, every one of our partners, we want to help, but we have to know when the issues are coming up to be able to address them. We can't just find out after the fact, we've got to know when it's happening so that we can make sure that we jump in and, and try and find a resolution as quickly as possible. So John, thank you. It was great having you. Um, Broker world, Bab, we will uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks guys.